Dr. Rob, people are going, what? A, a midweek podcast? What's what's going on here? More. It's more. It's all about just giving you more and more and more. We're that's, about, what, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get more out there for people. You know what we're trying to do? Produce more content. I, do you know what I love? I like putting content out there. <laughs> Dude, you know what? We've got a lot of content right now. Just a now. ton of content right now. Producer Owen does not like the term content. No. Oh, he it, feels like it's overused. Yeah, it's one of those. It, it probably is one of those words. Like um, vulnerable. Vulnerable now is be, is becoming an overused word because of Brene Brown has, is teaching everybody to be vulnerable, right? Who's Brene Brown? Brene Brown is a... I'm, she's, I'm, no, I'm Googling Women this. Women love Brene Brown because... Is it Brene? Brene. Brene Brown. She's at the University. University of Houston, I believe the University of Texas right now, but she's kind of like this guru when it comes to self-help. Women love her. Guys, eh, not so much. Cassandra Brene Brown, Brown. American yes. professor, lecturer, author, and podcast host. So there she's is, like us. You know what she does? She produces content. content. <laughs> nice. Research well, on shame, vulnerability, and leadership. That's right. Ooh, TED Talks. Yeah. Do you know what I have never done? Watched a TED Talk? Uh, well, actually, I've watched uh, one of my good buddies uh, from medical school, uh, Tim Erig. Tim is Tim's like a renaissance man. He's like he's had like four midlife crises and in like five different careers in his life. Like I've done two. Like I did pro football and I did the doctor thing. Yeah, he he was like he did a stint as a stand up comedian for a while. Out in L.A., he was a professional cyclist. Um, with uh, like, did he do the Tour de France? He never did the. I don't think he ever did the Tour de France. Uh, big, big bike races. And I'm thinking, was it? Uh, so you know, Lance Armstrong. I think. He, I think Tim was on. I believe the Motorola team. So he was blood doping. He was not the blood doper. He was too, in his words, he was too far down the chain of command. So there's all these guys on the team whose job it is to like ride ahead of the stars okay. and kind of clear a path for yeah. him. And so that was his job. He he was a path clearer and a, I know it sounds goofy, but a windbreaker. Like he's that guy who rides up front so, so and they, cuts the wind resistance yes. for the guys. So right they'll draft him. off him. Exactly. Okay. That was Tim's job. And yes, you can draft. He was a grunt. He was, right. it's, they were kind of the old linemen uh, of, of bike racing. Anyway, Tim did that international travel raced all over the world. Like I said, he was, he was the guy, he, he was the no glory guy though. He was just the the worker bee on the team, uh, which nine tenths of the team was worker bees, but he did that, uh, worked in a lab for a while. And then finally, when he was roughly my age at the time, I went back to med school, which was nearly 30. Uh, Tim went back to med school and decided he was going to become a doctor, went into internal medicine and then went into palliative care. And so he is a end of life and palliative care specialist and is actually one of the more renowned experts on it in terms of kind of the whole concept of dying with dignity. Okay. But kind of that idea that, hey, you don't necessarily have to fight this tooth and nail. That's not a euthanasia thing. It's, But it's one of those things like, hey, you know, when it's at the end of your life, you don't have to go live on a ventilator for a month before you die. Listen, if you know what's coming and you've got a comfort level with that, he kind of teaches patients and families how to work through that process okay. but it's over the last 10 years it's probably one of the more kind of one of the more growing emerging sciences within medicine but tim does that now okay so but anyway my I'm 10 minute answer one minute question uh you have a tendency to do that lots <laughs> lots i'm the king of <laughs> tangents but tim's got a great ted talk on the subject okay and if if you ever google tim erig uh uh I H R I G, yeah. Or is it I R H I G? I'm screwing up where you put the H. Anyway, Tim Erig, palliative care TED Talk. It'll pop right up. So this is a weird way to start this podcast, but uh, that's how we kind of go down death, different dying, directions. And death, dying, and TED. Yeah, Talks. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know why or even how we got that. Oh, we were talking about Brene Brown too. Uh, but you know, we've had the quarterback uh, discussion on the on this, and you've gotten mad at me. You've you've dropped an f bomb or two when it comes to the the One top two. the top five quarterbacks in Nebraska history. I, I would say, 
and I don't mean this disrespectful, one of the most probably forgotten about quarterbacks in Nebraska history who was an All-Big 8 quarterback, was an All-American quarterback, went on to be a Super Bowl starting quarterback, is Vince Ferragamo. Well, the guy was amazing. You know, I... You know, I think the thing is with with guys like Vince, so there was kind of that time period in the 1970s where you, you had Dave Hum, you had Vince Ferragamo. People forget about those Tom Osborne offenses that when you went through the Devaney era in the latter half of that where Osborne was the offensive coordinator and you moved into that time frame uh, through probably the first three-fourths of the 70s, up until maybe 79, 80, Nebraska had a pro style offense. They threw out the 1960s, 1970s. It was not that power running offense. It was not that triple op- option. Yeah, that that option offense. It was a pro style passing attack with a strong run game. I mean, it was a classic pro style offense. Uh, and I think people forget about some of the quarterbacks Nebraska had in that era. Well, Vince Ferragamo was one of them who went on to star in the National Football League, started for the L.A. Rams in the Super Bowl, went on to play in the Canadian Football League. He did, And then went back to the NFL yes. after that, which, you know, I guess the thing that I think about when you look at some of these guys, when you look at Fer- when you look at Ferragamo, I, I mean, he was great at Nebraska. I'm not saying he was, and didn't you mention, well, how come he's not on your top five list? No, no, Rob, I don't. But, I, I'm, um, I'm just saying he's one of those guys, you go, oh, Vince Ferragamo went to Nebraska. You, you, you kind of forget You kind it. of forget about him. Well, I don't know. I grew up in Lincoln, so I don't forget about the fact that he was a Nebraska grad. But, you but just, anyway. But but, you, I mean, when he when you talk about Jerry Taggy, when you talk about Dave Hum, when you talk about Vince Ferragamo, then you move into Turner Gill. Then you, I mean, there, there's just a, a long line of really good quarterbacks at Nebraska. They for, have had a lot. Yes. And make, putting together a top three or a top five is not easy no. to do because there have been some really good ones. Which, But the point I was going to make is that I think when you look at Ferragamo, despite the fact that he was all-conference, he was in a first-team All-American his best years were probably in the NFL. I, I mean, the guy took a team to the Super Bowl. Well, Vince Ferragamo is actually going to be coming back to Nebraska, and you are going to have a chance to see Vince Ferragamo. And, and I'm going to butcher this because I'm not Italian, but he's going to be in Omaha at uh, the Sisula Italia Foundation Night in Sicily uh, Gala. It's uh, it's coming up on Friday night, December uh, 9th at the... Um, at the Double Tree by Hilton downtown Omaha. Tickets are 100 bucks each, or you can get a table of eight for $800. And it's going to be a night to raise money for Sisula, Sisula Italia. I, see, I'm butchering that. I can't say it very well. And you like, you like Italy's your second I, home. Dude. But, but you know what? I don't have any Italian blood in me, and so therefore I'm not allowed to pronounce things properly. What is properly. justice? Uh, I believe I got a little Scottish, a little English in it's me. It's mutt. It's like Zadis. Yeah, it's yeah. mutt. Yeah. Well, actually. It's bo- we're bohunk. Well, mutts. hold on now. Hold on now. My my cousin Kim has actually done uh, like the, the 23 and Me, and I'm like a descendant of William Wallace. So how do you like that? I'm I'm picturing you on a horse, face painted blue, with a giant broadsword. Freedom! <laughs> yes. But uh, but again, it's Vince Ferragamo who's uh, coming to Omaha. You can see him, and you can hear him now as he joins us on the Doc Talk podcast presented by Betfred Sports. Vince, you're coming back to Omaha for the Sisula Italia Foundation uh, night uh, 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 gala that is going to honor uh, Sicily. Uh, first of all, h- how often do you get back to Omaha? Well, Travis and Rob, it's great to be on the show with you guys. Um, you know, I don't get a chance to travel back uh, to my old stomping grounds very much. My wife has, has been made a few trips back and forth but because uh, she's originally from Omaha. But my... Um, you know, my, my roots and a lot, a lot of fans and, you know, my, uh, you know, all the great memories that I had playing football at Nebraska are, are right there. So I wish I could get back there more often, but I will be coming back this December. So that's, I'm really looking forward to it. You know, you, you started at Cal. Let's just drive into football because I, I find it interesting. Yeah, we'll, okay, we'll get back to the foundation thing. I promise What that. else is there, right? <laughs> no, no, no. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get back into that. But it's interesting because for how big the transfer portal is right now in NIL, you know, even Rob was yes. surprised this morning. Yeah. He forgot that you transferred from Cal to Nebraska back in the early 70s. How big of a deal and how hard was it to transfer at that time during college football? 
Well, you know, the player has to initiate that uh, that trade in the beginning, and when you want to transfer um, from one school to another, and I I tell a lot of the youngsters that I wouldn't recommend transferring because <laughs> it's really difficult to to make that that transition. You know, once you've established yourself at one school and then to move to another school, um, you know, it's uh, it's difficult. You have to there's a an interim period of time. I was thankful to have that redshirt year to, you know, prove my worth there at the school or, you know, meet a lot of friends, make friends, make new friends. I made lifetime friends there at Nebraska. You know, my best man, my wedding was Jim Belka who played on the team with me. And I mean, I played with so many great athletes, great athletes. And only just a few of us went on to the NFL, which is kind of very surprising, but uh, we always had a great team and to play for a great coach like Tom Osborne was well worth the move. I, I played for Mike White at, at Cal and learned a lot from him in the passing game. Of course, he was the passing guru back then uh, and had made a great career co- throughout his coaching career. But Tom Osborne with the Bob Devaney group were special. And the entire the entire staff they had. And, you know, Rob, you played uh, under those guys. And that's how yep. good they were. They were good till the end, you know. Uh, we were close, you know, back in those days as well. But, I can just recall the the great uh, the great teams we had the great offensive play we had. I was on, you know, a show with uh, Jerry Murtaugh last week with <laughs> Big Bob Lingenfelter, and you know, the, in those days they had a lot of the great offensive line talent came from the state of Nebraska. You know, yep, and absolutely. They came and we were a power football team, and I think what made us different that year when I made that move is the the way we could throw the football. We surprised a lot of teams that. Uh, at our, you know, at our at full depth of, of, of passing uh, array that we used to, to pull on defenses. But, you know, the move was tough. The move was tough because, you know, coming out of high school, you really don't know which way. Everything sounds so good. And, and you know, I was uh, lucky I played for my older brother, Chris, and uh, at, at Banning High School, and he kind of influenced my decision to go to Cal. And then after two years, you know, with the probation we had to deal with there, never getting a chance to go to a Rose Bowl, I just felt that, you know, I wanted to go to a place that, uh, you know, traditionally was was great with football. There was a lot of support uh, throughout the university and play in front of a packed house every week. So it was a big thrill to go to a place like Nebraska. And so in those days, you know, Jerry Taggy and those guys won the national championship. So it was uh, it was a it was a great thing to go. So, great so school quite, to go to. So question for you. you: You talked about the probation that Cal's on. How right. did that come about? It's not like people sit around and think of Cal Berkeley yeah. as a place that would be on NC two A probation. <laughs> I mean, well, did, did somebody era, like not? I mean, did somebody like not carry the one on an equation or something? How does that? <laughs> <laughs> They found some fault with Nebraska recruiting, apparently. Uh, the Ray <laughs> Wilsey era before us, before Mike White got there, was uh, they were trying to, you know, of course, in the Big Eight at, or the Pac-8 at the time, um, you know, trying to elevate their status. But they just, uh, you know, maybe illegal recruiting. Um, gotcha. Uh, fraction, factions that uh, that happened to, to play a big role in why they got uh, cited for some illegal recruiting efforts. But then they applied that pro, that penalty on the on the next coaching staff, which was kind of hard to take. But you know, we had no way of going to to participate in in the Rose Bowl uh, regime. We could we could win the big the Pac Eight, but never play in the Rose Bowl. And as a kid growing up in Southern California, that's your that's your goal. Yeah, and that and throughout totally... my career, I always wanted to play there, and got a chance to play there finally. And uh, when I was with the LA Rams in the Super Bowl, so. <laughs> There you, you know, go. finally came true that that uh, that lifelong, you know, journey. You know, the, the to play at the Rose Bowl. The ironic part of it is that uh, what Cal was probably put on probation for back in the early '70s is now completely legal, right? I mean, oh, I guarantee <laughs> it's got to be. You probably can exactly. Which, which I mean, you look exactly. at some of the other teams in the in what kind of like what you said would have been the Pac-8 at the time. I mean, I assume like a USC, a UCLA. Um, you know, the, there's stories about. I mean, there, there's always stories about this team or that team, and it's always the gr- the really, really good teams. It's it's of that era in the '70s. It was Texas, it was USC, Nebraska had great teams. Oklahoma, Oklahoma absolutely. Right. Um, 
Penn State had some, Paterno had some really good teams in the 70s. Those were the schools that, I mean, you always kind of heard grumblings about like, hey, what are these guys doing from a recruiting standpoint? Are rules getting bent with with these schools? It Again, it just did, it kind of surprised me when you said Cal on probation. And I, but I get right. that though, where you say it's you've got a school that really wants to maybe make that jump and kind of make that jump to the next level. It, it just, I, I don't know. I'll always scratch my head at that, thinking that I, I would have thought the NC2A's eyes would have been kind of maybe focused on USC, focused on Texas, focused on Oklahoma when it came to the recruiting, the potential recruiting violations. Because a lot of times with that stuff, it's the kind of thing you almost have to go looking for. It's not usually all that overt. But the uh, that, you, That's a great point, Rob. Great point that you make. Yeah, I mean, you, you talk about the transfer stuff, though. Um, what was that really the reason then you wanted to kind of have that th- that chance to get to that next level and play in a bowl? Yeah, it, it kind of was, um, you know, and also to go to a university where football really meant, which, you know, was very important. Um, I know I was heavily recruited out of high school. I, I came back to Lincoln twice uh, for recruiting trips and Tom Osborne was very interested at the time. And, you know, I got distracted. I, I, I went to Cal for a couple of years and, um, you know, tried to make a, a go of it there and was able to beat Stanford my, my freshman year on the last play of the game. And it was a thrill. And that was the biggest game of the year. And I felt like, wow, would it be great to play every Saturday in front of a crowd like this? I mean, we were a packed house. Cal Stanford was the only game we drew, we drew anybody, any fans to. So, and, you know, so that in those days, that's the way it was. Um, you know, unfortunately, they, they penalized Cal and, and, and put them back on their heels again. And, you know, when you look at, like you mentioned, other schools, powerhouses like, you know, SC at the time, UCLA, how could they attract players from all over the country and get them to come each and every year? And they were powerhouses each and every year. John McKay had a lot to do with that back in those days. You know, he's a great coach and had a great staff, but so did Nebraska. But Cal just couldn't compete. You know, they couldn't compete. And, you know, they had uh, the, the one trivia question that keeps that, that keeps coming to mind for me is uh, what university has produced the most starting quarterbacks in the Super Bowl? And you know what university that is, right? No. Can you give me no? The, no, I don't. <laughs> Rob? USC? <laughs> okay, so see, people will say Alabama, Notre Dame, USC. It's Cal. He had five quarterbacks. Let me jog your memory. It was Joe I mean, Cap, Craig Morton. Good. Well, okay. Uh, there was uh, you got Rogers uh, now. Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Jared Goff. Oh, and I the, forgot the about part Goff. Of the question was me because because I was I was a transfer. I started at Cal and then went to Nebraska. So that's what tricks everybody. But it, they had five quarterbacks. You know, oh, go on. But Cal was a Cal was a great great school for quarterbacks. Were and, there um, were there other schools you were looking at when you made that decision to transfer? Yeah. Obviously, mm-hmm. you, you kind of mentioned the why with Nebraska, but were there other places that you looked other than Nebraska? Yeah, at the time when I was a senior in high school, Washington Huskies had a great program. Sunny Six Killer was graduating, and that was attractive to me because of the way they threw the football. Um, who they, the, who they was were, the coach there at the time? God, I can't remember at the time. They came and recruited me. They came to the house, and, you know, so it was uh, – that was that was a consider San Diego State, you know, was a was a great passing school uh, considered, but they weren't, you know, they weren't a, a you know, a, a, a real powerhouse team, really recognizable. So I, you know, I got uh, I was thinking Nebraska, but I think at the time, too, you know, I mean, travel was was difficult for me. I never really traveled out of the state when I was a young kid. We, my, my dad was, uh, you know, was a, a president of the local union at Ford Motor Company and we just a good Italian family that, that came from Boston, settled in, you know, Torrance, California. And I just, we just never went anywhere. You know, I was always uh, very close to the family and we always did things. And, you know, maybe a, a, a big step like Nebraska was, was tough for me to comprehend, you know, at an early age. And then maybe that had something to do with me not going there right out of school. But today now players go all over the place, you know, they, they don't really care even at an early age. 
Talk about a so, cu- talk about a culture but, shift, though. I mean, you go from the hippies of Berkeley yeah, to 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 the <laughs> you, right. to, to to the farmers of Nebraska. Were people in Southern California like, "What are you doing? Where are you going?" <laughs> I know exactly. It was a total. I mean, flip flop. I mean, 180 degree turn from a real liberal school to a very conservative school like Nebraska. But I love Nebraska. I I love. I love, you know, going to class every day and, and, and learning there. It was, it was a great institution, uh, great, like I say, great uh, tradition of, of football. And that's the reason why if you're a football player, you'd want to go to school. And we have to bring that back to, to Nebraska. You know, that's, that's the main thing. And I, when people ask me about it now, it's like we just, you know, it starts at the top, really. Right, right Rob? It's, it's like, you well, know, you got to have – Hey. Leg director, the university. I mean, they want to win, and you got to have the coach to get these guys. Well, and that's you something. Got to have the right guy. I mean, Travis, that's something you touch on all the time. Is yeah. that if you don't, if it, if you don't have university administration, it all comes top down. The university administration's got to right. be in support. I mean, of when, those athletic. Programs. I mean, look at Nebraska. It's had just as many athletic directors as it has coaches in this time, and actually, I think more athletic directors. And that's instability with leadership. It, it starts with leadership. Great leadership. Uh, right. it, it starts at the top, exactly. and the top is not the coach. No, one hundred percent. Yeah. Which and I loved because I, I played for Coach Osborne the whole way through my career as well too. It's as as a leader. I'm not saying I I don't hold up Tom Osborne is perfect by any means, but he was a very, very good leader. And I thought from a teaching standpoint, trying to impart those principles that he believed in, I, I thought he did an amazing job. And the fact that he was able to be that successful for that period of time, I always thought spoke volume. So one of, hey, one of the side questions I wanted to talk on so, Vince, am I correct in remembering? I, I actually met you. You spoke at, oh, boy, it was one of those uh, end-of-season academic honor banquets for the university. This, I couldn't, would have might have been 1992, 93. It was sometime in the early 90s. And I chatted with you a little bit there, and I swear to God you had told me that you actually started off majoring in pre-med. Am I correct in remembering that? Right, that's correct. Okay, I thought That's I correct. remember that. Hold on. I, that, mean, that, mean, that means we have two really smart guys in this podcast right now and one really dumb Iowa. <laughs> there you go. It's Iowa. Oh, don't, don't say that. Don't say that because uh, my, my in-law's family is from Iowa. So, you know, he went to school. He was a hot guy, and he was a, he oh, was a wrestler. God bless My father-in-law him. was. Oh, my God. That's r- awesome. Big Ten champion. Yeah. No kidding. He wrestled in the Olympics. Yeah, but so I, I don't mess with my wife too much. She's Sicilian, <laughs> so that's the reason why I'm coming to I'm coming to Nebraska December seventh for this, and it's called Sicula Sicula Italia Foundation, and a Sicula is a like a short name for Sicily, in Sicilian, and so uh, there's a there's a big, uh, you know, there's a big group of uh, Sicilians uh, that that um, that moved and settled in Omaha, and yep. uh, you know, a lot of them are my friends, and I know. Uh, you know, Anzaldo family. I, I knew Subby when he was around years ago, and Terry, now one of the sons, has taken over, and they're doing a great job. I'm just really looking forward to coming out and saying hello to all my old good, good old buddies. You know, they were they really supported uh, Nebraska football over the years. So you arrive on the seventh, I, I take it, and then the the event is actually the ninth of December. So your your wife's family is Sicilian. What is Ferragamo? Is that from Naples? Is it from We're Rome? We're not We're Naples. We're the second Sicily, they say. <laughs> <laughs> We're from the south as well. Not as far down as Sicily. Now, my wife's family, I mean, I, I think the Anzaldo family, the, you know, the sister city of Omaha is Carlentini, yep. and that is the uh, Provincia de uh, Seracuse, which is the southeastern part of uh, Sicily. Uh, you know, we traveled to Sicily and, and, and went around the beautiful, beautiful, one of the best times ever on a vacation uh, that we ever had, uh, my family. And so it was it was great fun and, you know, getting to know all the different places. Of course, my parents never were able to travel to Cis- or to Italy, but um, I, I had the chance to. And but, yeah, that's um, I think you're right. I think it is Friday, December 9th. Yep. Exactly. Is the, is the event date. And so. You know, we're really looking forward to coming back, but yeah, it's a uh, you know, it's a it's a good it's a good time to reflect back on your heritage and 
you know, it's, uh, that's the way I was born and raised, you know, Italian, I'm full blood Italian. My, my, my parents, both families were from uh, Napoli or the Provincia de Avellino, which is close to, uh, to Naples and the Ferragamo family, as you know, kind of originated from that area. So, um, yeah, that's where my family, but my wife's family, yeah, she's Sicilian. So half Sicilian, half Irish. So don't get in an argument with her. You're never going to win. <laughs> you know, it, it, I, I wish I could be at the event. I, I'm actually going to be in Italy the night of the event. I go to, t- my wife and I start going to Tuscany. Oh. We start going to Tuscany in 2009. I have zero Beautiful. Italian blood in me and we have gone every year oh, since. Seven. I was, so her and I, we, we go to Florence, we get a little apartment in Florence Beautiful. for a week and a half, and then we've done that for like the last uh, 10, 15 years. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Ilantini is a restaurant you have to go to in, in Florence. Write it down, Ilantini. Okay? okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful restaurant, one of the best meals I've had. I mean, all throughout Italy, you know, you, from the north to the south, especially in the south, the food is fantastic. And, and Florence is one of our favorite places as well. It's so nice to be there. Uh, Probably Italiano, no. You don't speak Italian, right? No, well, you know, I don't. I can say buongiorno. I can say buona notte. Buongiorno, I can say buona sera. Buona sera. I've got to. you. Well, that's all you need to know. I'm going to tell you the first time that I became familiar with the Vince Ferragamo name. So I'm from Iowa, but I grew up a huge Pittsburgh Steeler fan. So it was the Super Bowl where I, I I was sweating bullets that Vince Ferragamo was going to beat my Pittsburgh Steelers. That's that's the first time I heard of Vince Fer- Ferragamo. Which and you ha- had the well, lead had into the fourth quarter. The Super Bowl. Yeah, we did. We did, Rob. We were, we were leading them in the fourth quarter, 1917. But, Rob, this is a funny story. My wife didn't have a ticket for that game. I gave them all away to my my other all, m- most of the family. <laughs> hold on, so hey, hold on. She gets, she, yeah, she gets a ticket. So she must have called the Rams and got a ticket. So she's sitting. My dad and her are walking around the stadium. They sit down and they're sitting in the Pittsburgh. Well, the whole the whole place was, you know, filled with you know Pittsburgh Steelers fans and a lot of Ram fans too. It was a great you know 103,000 people at the game. And so she's sitting around these two guys, and the two guys are yelling, "Kill that guy! Kill that Ferragamo!" And they're and she patted him on the back. It was Tony Danza and uh, Danny DeVito. Oh my God! <laughs> they were big. They were big Pittsburgh fans. They go, "Oh, Mrs. Ferragamo, we're sorry. We're sorry. We're sorry. We'll, we'll calm it down." Said, but we're, we're, we're pulling for Vince too because he's Italian. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. She tells that story. Oh my God. That's amazing. What a time she must have had. But if you go yeah. back and wait, look, wait, at, hold on, hold on. I got to back up here a little bit. How did your yeah. wife not have a yeah. ticket? I don't know. I don't know. She didn't want to bug me the night before the game, so I said, "Yeah, well, I'll have to figure out my own way." You know, I guess she must have given them all away. You well, know, so we she had giving, you guys you know, had another them. funny story. She just gave them to everybody else. Well, we see. Okay, listen to this. This is a funny story. We were given 20 tickets each, okay? I don't think anyone knows this story, but you guys now. We're going to make it public. <laughs> it's coming out. <laughs> we were given 20, we were 20 tickets for the game back in those days. The average ticket price was $30 for the ticket, okay? For a Super Bowl so, ticket. For a Super Bowl ticket. Oh, in my 1970, gosh. 1980, January, January 20th, 1980. So we had 20 tickets. We go to Super Teams on an air flight. We were sitting right next to Franco Harris and 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 all those guys that we played. You know, we had the super, back in those days the Super Teams in Hawaii, right? Yeah. My wife is talking. My wife is talking to um, uh, w- or one of the Pittsburgh. I think it was. Uh, uh, yeah, it must have been Franco Harris or you know Mean Joe Green. Somebody's one of the wives, and she goes, "Oh yeah, she said that was a great game. It was fun to watch." You know, I had a lot of family there. We had 20 seats. It was awesome. She goes, girl, because you're not supposed to get 20 seats. You're supposed to get 40 seats. We've been to three of these Super Bowls. We already know. She goes, 40? <laughs> they got 40 seats. You know what happened to our other 20 seats per player? It went to Dominic. It went to Dominic um, uh, Frontieri. The he ended owner. up selling those tickets. got it thrown was- in jail. The owner, the owner was taking yeah, the, the allotment of tickets. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's where our tickets went. Come wow. on. You said no Frontier, and I'm like, oh. Said they have George, plenty of tickets. said George's husband. That's exactly. Man. Oh, my well, God. Well, nobody probably knows the story but you guys. Dude, but anyway, that's horrible. It's, uh, it's worth telling. 
Yeah. That is God bless horrible. Them. He's a great guy, but uh, they just they just uh, wanted to use more tickets. I guess he had more people, more so, things to do than we did. Well, because I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, so I played in the NFL. So it would have been 15 years later. My rookie year was 1995, which had, it's kind of weird because I think from like 1980 to 1995 seems like a really, really long time. But now I'm not. sitting here. But now mm-hmm. I'm sitting here, and I'm thinking it's like 2007 to 2022 does not seem like a long time in my head. But anyway, here nor there. So I, I played in '95, and at least then, every player in the NFL got an allotment of two tickets for the Super Bowl. So even if you weren't going, teams not going at all to the Super Bowl, every NFL football player got two tickets. And so well, that's all, not true anymore. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> maybe they, for got, you it is, Rob, but not for me. Yeah. I played too long ago. Well, no, I mean, not still. <laughs> no, to, no, not, only active players. Yeah, active players, active players. So, like, oh, not the active players. Yeah, oh, yeah so yeah, not right, today. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. yeah, so when I was still playing, we, we got two tickets. So I was with the Giants. I played for a really nondescript era in the Giants history. We, we didn't, we made the playoffs one year, got beat in the first round, and. That, that was kind of my glory season there. But it's while playing, we got an allotment of two tickets to the Super Bowl, mm-hmm. and everybody would sell them if you weren't going to go to the game. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, there's always a handful right. of NFL guys who do like to go to the game. Most of the guys would always say, it's like, yeah, we go to all the parties and tailgate, and then we go, we go home and watch the right. game on TV. And so sure. everybody would sell their tickets. And we would always sell them to the, one of our assistant coaches. His wife had a travel agency. And we would all sell our tickets to them. And then they would put together like a little ticket hotel airline package and then mark the price way up and sell those. But the, the going rate, I, th- I think the face value of Super Bowl tickets, kind of mid-90s there, from the ones we had, at least the, the the whatever section ours were allotted to, the face value was two hundred dollars. That that was face value by nineteen ninety five. Wow. However, everybody sold these at a huge markup, and so we would sell them to our buddy at the travel a- the, the the coach, this assistant coach whose wife had the travel agency. We would sell them all to her for a thousand each. So I mean, but it's it a good return on investment. That's yeah. a great return <laughs> yeah, on the investment, free, but free, free to a thousand bucks. Yeah, but no I'm kidding. but but I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about the fact that, like the going rate, like just like that first, hey, I'm selling these to the person who's actually going to sell them and mark them up, and I'm like, I'm making mm-hmm. a grand right now. And I mean, the, per ticket. And it's hard to believe the Super Bowl ticket in 1980 was thirty bucks. That's that's what's incredible. Yeah, which I'm sure. It, I'm, tell you. Yeah. Which I'm sure at the time, though, most people were like, <laughs> oh, my gosh, that is for a football game. Yeah. People are probably yeah, bitching right. and moaning exactly. about it back then, too. Uh, Vince, are you still in Are you still yeah. in real estate? Are you still Are you still making wine, too? Yeah, I, I do. I have touched on real estate as a DBA for normal real estate. I've been in business for 30 years. And yeah, it's been it's been it's been fun. Um, you know, it's here locally in Southern California. We do mostly residential uh, real estate. Uh, we do. I have a mortgage company, End Zone Mortgage. I wonder you probably can imagine where the names came from. But <laughs> and we do a private. We have a private fund as well. So we we've uh, yeah handled it through the times, through good and bad times. There's always been a market. We're uh, in a slow time right now, but we just came through a real uh, brisk market uh, six months to a year ago, and now it's slowed down way down. So with the rising inflation, so we're seeing a you know, things at a standstill now. So, but. Um, that's the sign of the times, but the, our uh, private mortgage fund is doing very well. Uh, people still need to, to get money uh, on a private side, and it's it's done quite well. And uh, did it, you still uh, you still doing wine? Yes, uh, we have a vineyard, VinceFerragamoVineyards.com. I produce a uh, super Tuscan wine. I've been Italian, you know. I've, uh, that's been my uh, my passion. I think over the years to to grow a, a varietal like they grow in Tuscany and we grow Sangiovese and Cabernet. We really? only have 200 and some odd vines. Uh, we produce uh, the boutique winery that yeah, we produce a gold medal winner and a super Tuscan is really delightful wine. It's a kind of an elegant, uh, 
rosé and um, uh, it's a, a rosso. It's a vino rosso and really nice wine. We eat uh, with uh, all the different Italian foods. And, and Sangiovese grape is m- one of the more universal grapes that really kind of you know blends or, or marries with with any type of cuisine that you won't want to enjoy. So it's uh, it's really good. It's great with the pastas and the meat sauces and the bolognese and also the vegetarian dishes. It's, it's very light on its feet and it's, uh, it's just, it's just a wonderful wine that we love to So if it's boutique, it means it's a hard wine to get for me, isn't it? Yeah, we don't, we don't have, but maybe 60 cases a year, oh, wow. 50, 50 cases, something like that. We produce only just right under a, a, a ton of grapes. That's it. And so it's a, it's a beautiful blend, 80-20. It's a, one of my favorite Italian wines with Tignanello. Uh, it's a super Tuscan wine, and I try to pattern it after. It's not a Tignanello, but it's, it's, we try to get as close as we can to it. And, um, yeah, the wine is, uh, is a beautiful combination of those two grapes. And um, we've been doing it now for, well, since 2007, 2008, we started growing the grapes. And uh, that that uh, signature wine that I was mentioning is a Caressa J. It's named after my three daughters, Tara, Vanessa, and Jenna. So my wife named it Caressa J. And it's been a it's been a really nice wine over the years. Well, you've had uh, some great stories, and you're going to be telling great stories on Friday, December 9th. It's the Sicula Italia Foundation uh, Night in in Sicily uh, dinner. You can see everybody can get the uh, the, the link to purchase tickets uh, on, on the YouTube channel and also on the Podbean channel or wherever you're listening to this. Uh, Vince, I, I'm telling you, we could probably talk uh, two hours with you, but I do want to be respectful of your time, and I, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate you telling the story about your owner, you know, <laughs> taking half your tickets. <laughs> Confiscating all those to Super Bowl tickets. Yeah, well, that'll. Uh, some people will probably debate that, but it's okay. Now, did I hear a rumor that your <laughs> mother-in-law is still alive and lives on, like, still like in the old Italy yes, area? Yes. Yeah, uh, Eileen. Eileen is still doing well. She's back there. Yeah, my father-in-law passed away uh, a few years back, but uh, she's doing well, and look forward to seeing her and the family. And my my wife's sister uh, Teresa has uh, got a bunch of children and grandchildren. Had nine kids, and she's got a bunch of grandchildren. So they'll probably all be at the event too. So we're gonna have to buy quite a few tables. <laughs> Just well. like that. Table of eight That's is just fun. eight. No, we look forward to seeing you guys. Well, I'm going to be you for having me on. No problem. I'm going to be in Italy, so I'll be thinking about you. But maybe we can get Rob down there for you. I got to check my schedule. Okay, sounds that good. That sounds guys. like an outstanding Rob, event. Travis, thank you very much for having me on. Rob, I I, I could have had a much longer conversation with Vince Ferragamo. Right well, there. and it's one of those things where there's kind of these little side stories because. You know, I, I t- we touched on just a little bit about the fact that he started off as a pre med major. I shouldn't say started off. So the conversation I had with him at that academic banquet, he said he actually went ahead and started med school. Now, I, I, I swear to God, he said it was back at UNMC, University of Nebraska's Medical Center. Um, and they kind of helped him out a little bit in terms of scheduling classes during his football off seasons where he would take the coursework during the spring semester. Some of those classes, I thought he said through UNMC, they kind of worked it out so he could do some of the stuff through UNO again, just from a scheduling standpoint. But he said it took him four years to finish the two years of classroom work that's required for medical school. And he said it was sort of this combination of took four years to get two years done with the classroom work. And then in order to try and get all of the clinical training, all of your rotations where you go work with the surgeons for a few months, you go work with ear, nose and throat guys for a month, you go work with the family practice docs for a few months, all of those clinical rotations, he said it was looking like that was going to take probably far more than an additional four years to try and get that done. And he said at the same time, he was working through still being an NFL football player, still training yeah. off season for that. And it started a few businesses at the time. And I know there was the real estate company. I think he said he initially had maybe dabbled in automotive sales for a little bit. I, I might be mistaken on that, but that's kind of what I recall. And he said that business world really appealed to him as well and, and kind of that whole that whole entrepreneurship route he said that 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 spoke to him and it was something that he felt was going to be more f- fulfilling 
than trying to put all that time and all that effort to try and complete the medical degree. So if you want to go hear Vince uh, Ferragamo speak and be with a bunch of Sicilians and Italians, and where you know what, on a night like this, everybody's going to be Sicilian. Everybody's going to be Italian. It's coming up on a Friday, December 9th at the Doubletree by Hilton downtown Omaha. It's the Sisula Italia Foundation uh, fundraiser. They do a lot of good stuff. And uh, you can see more uh, about uh, what they do at uh, SiciliaItalia.org. Uh, there's a link on the YouTube page, also on the Podbean page. Check it out because lots of good stuff uh, right there. Hey, this is kind of a bonus podcast in the middle of the week. But we do want to thank our sponsors, Betfred Sports. If you want a $20 free bet, uh, download the Betfred Sports app in Iowa, Arizona, or Colorado and use the promo code DOCTALK. I want to thank our good friend uh, Connor Orr. Or over at Or Horgan and Flenty. Uh, if you need a, a litigator, Connor's your guy. If you need a sports uh, NIL type uh, situation where you want to work with an athlete, Connor is your guy. Husker Hounds, Scotty over at Husker Hounds, uh, two locations in the Omaha area and online at huskerhounds.com. And of course, our good friends over at uh, Tickets for Less. You need Nebraska football tickets, you need Creighton basketball tickets, Nebraska basketball tickets, 402 398 1999 is the number to call. And when you check out, uh, by going to ticketsforless.com. Use the promo code DOCTALK at checkout and you're going to get even more savings right there. For Dr. Rob Zadiska, I'm Travis Justice. We will talk to you next time on the Doc Talk Podcast presented by Betfred Sports. Betfred Sports.